Good, uh, good afternoon to all of our SA-based uh, SA based clients and either good morning, good afternoon or good evening, um, depending on where you find yourself in the world for our global base of clients as well. My name is Stuart Dando. I'm the key individual for AMA Africa. That's the SA based business. And I'm also the chief investment officer for Austin Morrison Associates International. I'm joined today <clears throat> on this webinar, excuse me entitled RSA and the potential gray listing that is coming up quite soon. For those of you that haven't heard anything about this, you are going to be hearing a lot about this in the news. You're going to be hearing acronyms like FATF and FAZE and FICA and all sorts of other interesting things. And myself and the other two panelists today will try and unpack everything, what it all means, and most importantly, what we think um, the, the, the implications are going to be going forward. I'm joined today by Mr. Wesley van Royen. He will introduce himself uh, when it is his turn to speak, and then he will hand over to Mr. Kirk. McCardle, who will then have a chance to um, address some issues as well. So let's kick off. Oh, for those of you that are for those of you that are taking furious notes, just so you know, there will be a recording sent out to everyone. So first things first, let's have a look at some uh, some topics. Um, so what is a grey listing? So firstly, let's take a step back and look at the organization that actually publishes what they call the grey list. This is something called the FATF. It's the Financial Action Task Force. It is a global anti-money laundering body. It's basically a watchdog. Um, and it was founded in 1989 and is headquartered in Paris in France. It has 39 official members. It has many associate members and also observer um, organizations and also what they call FATF style regional bodies or FS, um, FSRBs. If you total all of those together, you're looking at just over 215 jurisdictions globally. So a very, very important, um, a very uh, important sort of body. So what they do is they look at two things. They look at anti-money laundering and they look at the countering of the financing of terrorism. So AML and CFT, those are two acronyms that you will see quite a lot in the coming months. So basically what they do is they assess a country's readiness or a country's ability to defend against um, sort of criminals and uh, criminal elements being able to launder money and finance terrorism through their banking system and through other systems within the country through government and so on and so forth. So when they put you on the grey list, what essentially that means is, is they have monitored you, they've assessed you, and they have said that you have perceived deficiencies in your anti-money laundering or AML and the combating or countering of financing of terrorism, CFT. So basically what that means is they have looked at your current policies and procedures when it comes to AML and CFT, they have declared you to be deficient in some way. And what they normally do is they will then give you fair warning. And if you do not meet their recommendations, of which there are 40 recommendations, that's 4040, they will put you on something called a grey list. Currently, there are 23 countries on the grey list that includes places like Pakistan, the UAE, the Cayman Islands, Cambodia, and Senegal. So why are we having this webinar today? It's because South Africa has been warned that if we do not get, if you'll forgive the term, our act together when it comes to AML and CFT legislation, that we will be going on to this particular grey list. We have until the end of next month, October 2022, to submit our final report. Um, and it's important to note that this report is not to say that we are suddenly efficient when it comes to addressing these issues. What it means to say is that we do have a credible action plan in place that we are able to, that we are able to honour, that we we are able to execute and that will then hopefully satisfy the FATF. Um, that's the, we will get their decision off so that our cutoff is October 2022. After that date, soon after, we're not quite sure how long it'll take, we will then receive a decision and that a decision will be sort of officially taken at the plenary meeting of the FATF, which happens in February 2023. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's it's something that has been it has been in the news in the last couple of weeks. Um, I've been chatting to different investment professionals, uh, been chatting to CEOs, been chatting to economists, and the mean opinion or the average opinion is that SA is going to be listed um, is going to be listed on this uh, on this gray list. Um, what will what will the implications of that be? I think I'll deal with that um, towards the end once I've handed over to Wesley and to Kirk. Um, but basically what it means is enhanced monitoring or enhanced due diligence, otherwise known as EDD. So right now, for those of you that are in the banking industry or the uh, financial services industry or related industries, you get something called CDD, which is client due diligence, and then you get something which is EDD, which is was enhanced due diligence. If you are a country that is put on the gray list, there are additional enhanced due diligence obligations put on you as a country, both for money moving out of the jurisdiction and for accepting funds into the jurisdiction. 
Interestingly, because it is a country we're going to talk about momentarily, I think Kirk's going to cover it. Uh, Mauritius, our neighbor, was placed on the FATF gray list in February 2020 and existed just on 20 months after that, after an enormous amount of hard work on the part of the Mauritian government and constant interactions with the FATF to make sure that Mauritius was meeting its, uh, meeting its obligations. When Mauritius finally uh, produced its report, they had met set to a satisfactory degree 38 of the 40 recommendations and the FATF were comfortable that they had plans in place to meet the remaining two and that's enormously important. Um, so yeah, uh, we are going to deal, I'm going to hand over to uh, Mr. Wesley von Roy now, he'll introduce himself, he'll chat a little bit more about EDD and how it, um, and how it sort of translates uh, into a South African context, and then he will then hand over to uh, Kirk, who will chat about what we as a business are doing, a little bit more about foreign investing, and taking a little bit of a proactive approach to something that we're not saying on this webinar is definitely going to happen, but it is something on the horizon that it is best we be prepared for for should it happen and the mean like i said the uh, the mean opinion of most market watchers economists and people i speak to um are that that is actually going to happen so let me hand over to wesley now wes are you there yes i'm here thanks Stuart. brilliant thank you? you very much over to you yes i can indeed your slide is up great thanks thanks Stuart. thanks for the introduction uh yes my name is wesley van royen i am key individual of ama africa and head of compliance um, I see you've covered a few of my points there, Stuart, but I'd like to go a bit more in depth on what this actually means from a regulatory point of view and how this fits into our local practice in business here in South Africa. Um, yes, so the Financial Action Task Force is a global regulating authority. Uh, we do have local regulating authorities. Ours here in South Africa is called FIC, which is the Financial Intelligence Center. Uh, the Financial Intelligence Center here in South Africa is in charge of gathering and reporting back to Treasury, who then reports back to the Financial Action Task Force about our effectiveness, our, our co compliance processes are here in South Africa. So in the report, uh, it's important to understand in the report of the Financial Action Task Force, there are about 40 points raised of deficiencies, perhaps, or a few holes in South Africa's uh, FICA intelligence um, as well. But there was actually there was actually two points of concern that has actually led us down the road to be recommended of being added to the grey list. So I'm going to discuss those two points as the most important points. Um, and uh, ironically, you know, look, our, our banking system has has been way ahead of the rest of the financial services when it comes to screening and due diligence of clients. Um, so when when this evaluation was done by FIC, um, there were about 800 uh, financial services providers that fell within the category of doing other business besides banking or collective investment schemes. So the 800 would include uh, your car dealerships, your financial service providers, such as us, um, even estate agents. And basically... What they've done is of those 800 uh, in that report, they have found that um, there's quite a few areas that need much attention that has obviously now um, given the attention to the Financial Action Task Force that we need to focus more on these points. So the two, the two points that led us down this road, um, the first one was uh, a significant uh, owner. And the second was uh, a risk-based monitoring approach. So I'll go in detail through those two points. So a significant owner is it was it was basically found in the report that many of the F FSPs, financial services providers, um, had owners, directors of companies that were not actively involved in the compliance aspect or the upkeep of complying, but yet still had um, they still had. Uh, a swing in, how, in which way the businesses would go and could influence or perhaps have a conflict in compliance requirements. So there's been a significant um, effort by the Financial Services Conduct Authority to gather information on your directors or your significant owners, if you like, on these financial services providers to get a better understanding of who they are, how they run these businesses, and behind that, whether or not there they are, are, are money laundering, 
uh, terrorist financing or suspicious transactions as well behind these uh, owners. So what we're looking at is a shift away from the key, the key individuals in charge of, of enforcing FICA, at the FICA uh, compliance, but rather also bringing in a significant owner to say, yes, he is also responsible for decisions made in the business and should comply with uh, the FICA Act as well. Um, what we did see in 2000, this is now the second point, 2017, we did see new regulation come about where we were moving away from, um, we're moving away from a rule-based, um, well, sorry, we're, we're moving away from a rule-based monitoring system um, and moving into a risk-based approach monitoring system. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of engagement with the public out there, and um, a lot of these 800 plus uh, FSPs didn't quite understand how to approach the new system as a risk-based approach of monitoring. So what's actually happened is, although the banking systems have already adopted the risk-based uh, approach of monitoring, uh, the rest have not. And um, the they basically did a market analysis on this, and it turns out a lot of them don't know how. Um, there hasn't been enough communication from the local regulator. Um, so they have basically just stuck to what they know, and that was a rule base. So when we talk about a rule base, that would be anything from a client walking into a bank, and the rule is they must produce an ID copy, they must produce a, a, a proof of address. These are all rules. This is what you need to collect. So what they are saying is that we need to now look at a risk-based approach. A customer walks in, yes, we still collect what we need to collect, but what is the risk of doing business with this client? What is the purpose of the transaction? So what's, what's the, these two points of what was identified by the Financial Action Task Force has basically now gone back to Treasury and said, you need to come up with a solution by October. And the uh, local authorities, FIC, have said, yes, uh, we are going to engage with uh, these uh, FSPs. We are going to start rolling out an educational sort of um, regular, a regular educational um, webinars where we can educate them and, and, and uh, basically get everybody on board to start reporting appropriately from a risk-based point of view. Um, from, AMA's, from AMA's side, AMA Africa, um, we did adopt the risk-based monitoring approach when the Act was amended in 2017. We did produce um, what we refer to as an RMCP, which is a, a risk compliance monitoring process. Um, part of this process was first to educate our staff through various uh, FICA um, tests and engagements so that they're they are better equipped to identify uh, activity like money laundering um, and terrorist financing. Um, so when we in, when we did implement this, we do have a, a client um, enhanced due diligence process that runs through our CRMP. And uh, should a client's transactions be um, should, a client, uh, should should be suspicious, it is up to me as the FICA compliance officer to report directly to FIC. Um, FIC will obviously then deal with those transactions accordingly. Um, fortunately, we haven't found many of those, but uh, we do have enhanced processing. Um, so we do, we, we, we do report regularly on a monthly basis uh, to the regulator on these types of transactions. And I think this is what the industry should be doing. Um, yes, I do agree that our local um, regulators FIC, have not been uh, engaging with the public or these FSPs appropriately. And now we found ourselves in the situation over here. Um, funny enough, we did have a look at the International Monetary Fund um, paper that was released where they actually did in-depth investigation on what the actual consequences are for a grey listed country. And basically what we saw in there was a very small decrease in GDP of about 3%. And the reason for that was although we are dealing with enhanced due diligence, extra compliance, at the end of the day, according to this paper, as long as the cost of compliance is lower than the potential of return, they will always still do business with the grey listing countries. So I think grey listing is a name and shame for a country. It doesn't mean we can't come off, but that's as far as the Financial Action Task Force can go, is to list us on, on the grey list. 
when we look at who's in, in charge of actually enforcing these uh, regulations, that would be our local regulator, which would be FIC. They are res responsible for fines. They are responsible for bringing the industry in order. Um, but yes, so we are looking at some interesting times. Uh, hopefully we don't go on October, but indications are saying we will be. Um, I'm going to be handing over to Kirk McArdle. Kirk, are you there? I am, Wes. Thanks very much. Cool. Good afternoon, all. Um, my name is Kirk McArdle. I am the Africa Regional Manager for Austin Morris Associates. Uh, I've worked for Austin Morris for over 13 years now, and I have been located in our Johannesburg office for the last nine since its inception. Um, okay, Stuart, if I could have the next slide over, please. Fantastic. Excellent stuff. OK, so Austin Morris Associates, um, we have uh, many different companies within the overall group. Um, we have uh, around two years ago created Austin Morris Associates International, and we have been um, successful and applied for our unrestricted investment advisor license, which was given to us by the FSC there. Now, over the course of the next four months, um, we have to take a, a proactive approach in case come February 2023, we do go on to the grey list. So over the course of the next four months, we'll be looking to move as many of the international investments that we have here under the African agencies uh, away from here and onto the uh, international license. It's a very comprehensive license. Um, we will more than likely be coming to our clients with just a couple of regulatory forms to facilitate that change of agency from Austin Morris Associates Africa to international. Um, there will be uh, the potential for a couple of uh, institutions to have to stay under our global agency or our European agency, which we have recently also conducted and closed um, so that's we're going to aim for that before the end of January 2023. So it's going to be quite a busy period for us to to have all of our clients and investments transferred away from Africa before that 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 February 23 potential deadline. Um, so the leadership team which we have here at Austin Morris, the directors and management team, we are engaging with the institution. Uh, providers and international trustees where investments would be housed with uh, just to understand if they have any additional uh, reporting or enhanced due diligence required uh, requirements at their end so we can be again as proactive as possible to make this as a seamless transaction for our clients as possible now under Austin Morris Associates International, we also have uh, the ability for a discretionary management service, and that's what the unrestricted investment advisor license brings to the table as well. So if we have an investment in, um, in the, the international markets and they're going up, um, we have the ability to change model portfolios around um, we can uh, take funds out, put new funds in, change with allocation weightings. Now, that has the potential for greater returns, greater growth, which is what everyone really, really likes. Now, for me, the, as a financial advisor, the, 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 the actual downside protection on, on uh, a discretionary management service is, is the key for, for this. Now, when markets start to go down, like we have had for the first six months of this year, um, we have the ability to change model portfolios around and move to safer havens, um, maybe bonds if they're relevant at the time, or even hold cash. So we can also protect one's capital in, in the event of a downturn market. Now, by signing up for the discretionary management service, that's actually what it is. It's discretion. So we can actually change all of the client's portfolios, either going upwards or on the downside, because you've already signed up to allow us to do that. Now, in what environment would that really be beneficial for a client? As I say, the downside is, is the key aspect for me. Now, let's put it into this context. We start to see the markets falling uh, away. The consultant will contact the client, explain that to them. The client will do some research. They had agreed to that. The consultant will then have to send the regulatory forms and switch all dealing instructions to the client to sign off. We would then have that to the Austin Morris uh, administration 
and we'd process that and send it on to either the trustees for signing or directly to the institutional partners where they would uh, facilitate those changes. Now, if the client isn't in the office, if they're on holiday or if they're on the beach, we have that ability to change the investment port portfolio without that initial sign off. So already been agreed for you at the very beginning. So the downside protection to protect your, your, your capital is the key element, which this uh, unrestricted investment advisor license does bring to the table. So not only are we looking to um, move uh, the, the international investments away from Austin Morris in, in relation to that grey listing, we're also going to be looking to um, talk to our clients, engage with our clients to see if there's any benefits from their side of, of, of things to actually apply that DMS facility um, to their investments. Now, the standard Austin Morris um, service fee, some investments might be a little bit more, a little bit less, but typically across the board, it's 1%. The uh, discretionary management service would come with an additional 0.3% uh, on, the, on the service fee. But I'm sure that most of you agree that 03 is a very slight, small price to play just to protect your capital on the downside. So um, I'm sure over the course of the next four months, when we look to transfer your, your investments away from the African agency to international, your servicing consultant will actually um, cover the, the finer points of the discretionary management service with you as well. Um, and on that, I will hand back to Stuart Dando to close off and, and, and cover the rest. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Kirk. Um, okay, so I did. I did see whilst uh, sorry, Wes, while you were doing your uh, your bit there, I did see a little bit of a surge in participants. Let me just greet them again, if you don't mind. So, good morning to everyone. Sorry, good afternoon for everyone joining from SA, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening if you're joining from someplace else in the world. Um, just a quick thing. So, what I'm going to do is now I'm going to ask Wesley a question. I'm also going to ask Kirk a question. And what I'd like to, while I'm doing that, if any of you have any questions, please put them in the chat or the Q and A. We do have someone monitoring those questions. And if we have time at the end, once I've asked my two questions, we'll then get to some of those. Um, if your question is in the chat and it isn't answered today, we will be sending out answers to those questions with a recording of today's session. Um, so you will get an answer to your question either way. So please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Before I kick off, um, particularly from a South African context, None of what we say here today is intended or is to be construed as financial advice. If any of you are looking for financial advice regarding your onshore investments or offshore investments, you're more than welcome to send us uh, an email or visit our website and we will definitely put you in touch with one of our professional financial advisors. Um, so Wes, if I can start with you, um, you mentioned something a moment ago, which I think is an illustration of the congruence of both Treasury, the South African Reserve Bank and the FAT of recommendations. You spoke about, um, you spoke about the, did you say significant owner? Was that the, the phrase you used? Significant ownership, yeah. The significant ownership. Now that ties in nicely with one of the 40 recommendations and they talk about, it's another acronym, so I apologize, which is a UBO, which is the ultimate beneficial owner. So maybe just a point and then my question to you, Wesley. So in a South African context, what that would mean is if we as an organization do business with a company or a trust, we would need to know who the ultimate beneficiaries, beneficiar, uh, beneficiaries of those entities are. So we would require the company documents or a trust deed, whatever it might be. And that's just sort of natural client due diligence. So Wesley, my question to you is as follows. We speak about EDD and enhanced due diligence. What would that actually look like on the ground? So from a banking environment to a financial services industry and maybe sort of a an almost a meshing of the two, sort of broad jurisdictional observation, what will EDD look like um, in practice? Okay, fantastic. Great question. So I, I don't think it's a, a strange concept because the, the banking system have been following it for quite some time. I think it's like I said, it's the rest of the financial services provider industry that is catching up. Um, so when we look at what is enhanced, I mean, we, we, we practice enhanced due diligence when necessary. I mean, we're not going to screen every single person, but we will do our customer due diligence on everybody. What we are looking for here is suspicious activity, transactions, um, what is the intended relationship between the client and AMA Africa, and um, we are also looking at terrorist financing and money laundering. So when, for an example, somebody might show up as perhaps a politically exposed person, for an example, and um, look, there's a lot of bad media around a, a, a politician. So we tend to do our enhanced diligence on somebody like that. You know, where's the money coming from? Has tax been paid? 
So additional documentation will be required should an individual be identified as someone perhaps of a high risk. So those types of things could be anything from a tax certificate or additional sources of wealth. Um, so it's, it's, it's all about getting to know the clients. We are on the ground and we have the relationship with the clients and that's what the regulator wants to know. They want to know who we're doing business with and who is and what those relationships are. So in practice, yes, I do, I do foresee that these financial service providers will have to uh, invest a little bit more in their compliance department in that, in that sense, um, but it is necessary. And um, as a global sort of uh, a global achievement would be that we all work together for the common goal of eliminating terrorist financing and money laundering activities. And uh, South Africa would have to report everything, all their findings through to, um, through to the, the global regulator as well. But like I say, it's not, a, it's, it's not a new concept. It's always been around. Fortunately, we have a very, a very advanced and sophisticated financial services industry in South Africa. We have the building blocks. We have the foundation to run such compliance activities. It's just about the education um, of, of the rest of uh, the FSPs. Thank you, Wes. You put a very nice positive spin on that. Um, but I think I think right at the beginning of this webinar, I promised everyone there'd be a lot of acronyms and you missed an opportunity to introduce a new one, which is a PEP, which is a politically exposed person. So uh, yeah, yeah. the uh, the webinar will be replete with acronyms. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so thanks for that, uh, so Wes. So Kirk, over to you. Um, in, in our game, um, we, we, we chat to a lot of South African clients who perhaps have, you know, sufficient retirement savings in, in, in South African RAND, um, but are looking to move money offshore. But I think there is definitely a prevailing um, sort of fear or opinion that moving money offshore is actually quite difficult. Um, a lot of clients that I've, that I've engaging for the first time, I know um, our consultants, when they engage them for the first time, there's almost this sort of a little bit of trepidation when it comes to moving money offshore. Um, what, would, you, would you say it's, it's difficult for a South African to move money offshore currently? And can you provide maybe some detail on that? Um, I can certainly say that it's it's currently not as much red tape as it's potentially going to be in 2020, February 2023, Stuart. Um, okay. So... Uh, here at Austin Morris, uh, the group of companies, we've got many different regular savings options uh, where clients could save money on a month by month basis. And we've got various lump sum opportunities as well. Um, now, South African residents, they all have the ability to externalize one million ZARs with a foreign discretionary currency every single year. Uh, and they can also uh, externalize a further 10 million ZAR with tax clearance. Now, the tax clearance is usually granted from SARS with um, making sure that all of your e-filing with taxes is up to date and you don't actually owe SARS any outstanding taxes. Um, once that's issued, it can also get issued to your spouse as well. So a collective husband and wife or wife and wife and husband and husband in today's day and age, um, they can actually externalize up to 22 million ZARs worth of currency every calendar year, as long as you don't owe SARS any taxation money. Um, now, different jurisdictions and institutions, they all have varying levels of underwriting and due diligence as well. Um, but it is currently a very straightforward process, Stuart. Um, if you're looking to externalize uh, additional money on an annual basis into an existing investment already, Potentially in 2023, in February 2023, that is also going to fall under the grey list requirements. So just because you've got an existing investment already doesn't mean that you're going to be exempt from the new additional reporting due diligence that we've already gone through. So it's going to actually affect every single person, whether or not it's a new investment or a current investment uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, I mean, what I would say is if I know we've got some clients and we also have prospects on, on, on here as well, but if anyone really wants to explore um, any new or even additional avenues, then I would certainly recommend speaking to one of our specialist consultants here at, at Austin Morris Associates Africa, where we can look for the, 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 the best place and that we can actually look to place your money. Brilliant. Thanks, Kirk. Um, just maybe a final point from me, and then I will hand over to uh, Kerry Ann, who's our global head of marketing. She's been running some of, I see we've got some questions coming through, which we'll get to in a moment. 
Um, in terms of so some of the some of the actual experience we've had with this. So as as Kirk um, spoke to a short while ago, we are now the proud owners of or holders of an unrestricted investment advisor license. We received that license shortly before um, Mauritius was placed onto the grey list. So we have first hand experience of how a grey listed entity is being treated. Um, you could say that Mauritius is a far, is a far smaller country than SA and there, there, there is some utility in that argument. But to give you an idea of what happened on the ground, many of the major European banks would simply refuse to do business with the jurisdiction, um, as, well as, as well as some big, big international platforms and providers simply weren't um, interested in going through, jumping through any more hoops. They simply said, you're on the grey list, we're not doing business with you. Um, and that was that. So the, the point will come across then, um, as Wesley alluded to earlier, to say, you know what, what so he, he referenced uh, an IMF paper, which is actually a very interesting read, which spoke about the, the impacts on capital flows, foreign direct investment. But sometimes you could argue that the sum of the parts is not necessarily as great as the whole. What I would say to you is if South Africa gets grey listed, that in and of itself is one thing. Where the concern would lie are the other variables that are not necessarily playing into our favor. Uh, look at the value of the currency, um, again, look at load shedding, look at corruption and perceived corruption. So not that I'm, I'm, I'm definitely an optimist and those who know me know that I'm always talking about a glass that's half full. Um, but it does, when, once you combine all these variables together, it does paint um, a very challenging picture. And I think a lot of people in very high positions are gonna make, are gonna have to make some really, really big, important and ultimately good decisions very quickly um, for a lot of these risks not to materialize. Um, so yeah, that's the final point from me. Um, Kerri Ann, are you there? Do you have some uh, questions for either myself or Wesley or Kirk? I am, I am. Um, the first question that's come up in the chat box is from um, Robert and basically um, he, he missed a little bit from the beginning just with a network issue. Um, the question is, did you have some facts on your Mauritian business when the country was still on the gray list? And can you give a specific example? So yeah, the impact. So is that aimed at? Is that for myself? I'll I'll will take that one unless Wes or Kirk want to wait. Yes. In. Yeah. So yeah, there there were some impacts on the ground. Like I said, we did have, and maybe I preempted the question a little. Um, in terms of enhanced due diligence, there are there are there are quite a lot of guidelines, but there are no specifics enough. when it comes to oh, in, uh, when it comes to that. <laughs> Look at a previous case. So it's so if you're not talking, please put yourself on mute. Thank you. So yeah, on the ground, like I said, a lot of European banks, uh, particularly in Europe, the UK. Uh, simply refused to do business with a, a Mauritian-based entity, uh, weren't even interested in looking at any additional in, sort of enhanced due diligence, simply said, nope, we're not doing it. We had a couple of our providers that stopped uh, accepting new business, uh, and we were actually in negotiations to set up terms of business to do, to do business with some international entities in the UK, um, and they simply said, until Mauritius is off of the grey list, we simply aren't going to entertain those discussions. So, for the island of Mauritius, it did have some real world impacts. Um, what those impacts are gonna be for South Africa, given that South Africa is a much bigger economy, especially if you look at things like um, commodities and so on and so forth, um, it's, it's very hard to predict, um, but ultimately it, it, will not, it, it won't be a good thing. It definitely won't be a good thing. It will have an impact on capital flows, foreign direct investment, um, ultimately our balance of payments perhaps, and so on and so forth. So it is, not, it is not a list you want to be a part of, and it is a list that you need to exhaust every effort to try and stay off of. So like I said earlier, hopefully our politicians and the people in power are making the the big decisions, the right decisions, the good decisions um, to avoid um, to avoid are being placed on the list. I hope that answers your question. Um, Kerri Ann, do you have another one? Yep, so we've, we got are, one, um, we've got about eight or nine minutes left, so we probably can perfect. have space for so two questions. We've got two. So um, the first one is just around: Do you need a passport to send money offshore? And um, then that was an anonymous question. I'm not sure who's happy to take that one. I'll hand that to Kirk. I think. In terms of South Africa, um, most of the South African banks will send money offshore with a South African ID or green book. Um, obviously, they can map your South African ID number from that. And that is part of um, the, the FICA requirements, as, as Wesley has gone through with you. Um, when it comes to international banks, uh, they would only pretty much work off a passport. It's the only recognized um, pro uh, proof of ID that which they would work with. Um, when it comes to proof of IDs, there are a number of key elements around the passport, 
One is a signature and two is an expiry date. Now, in South Africa, where they're able to map your South African ID in the background to take off all your personal information from it on the international marketplace, they can't do that with an SA ID. Um, so they have to have uh, a form of ID, typically a passport. Some institutions will also take a, a driving license, but it has to have a signature and it has to have an expiry date on it. Thank Thanks Kirk. for that, Kirk. Um, and then we've got another question. Um, will the grey list affect existing offshore portfolios that are currently licensed um, under Asia? No, I can take that one as well if you want to do it. <laughs> yep, please. Um, Over to you. Okay, so when it, come, when it comes to grey listing, it actually works both ways. Now, here at Austin Morris Associates, certainly in Africa, we actually we're an international wealth management company. Yes, we do have local investments as well, but primarily we would look for externalizing assets. So it's transferring money outside of South Africa. Now, it, it also works the reverse way as well. So if, if, if clients and prospects also have money offshore in the UK, if they sold a property, if they've lived there for a while and they're bringing money back to South Africa, it also affects the, the, the money transfer coming back in. Um, the grey listing actually affects the banking industry in South Africa, not the internal banking industry. So if you have an FNB account, and you want to transfer money to uh, a NED bank account, that's not an issue, but it's money in and out of South Africa in general. So to answer the question, will the grey listing affect offshore portfolios that are currently on the Asia license? I'm actually going to say no, broadly but if you have a south african client that's looking to bring money back if they were to move back here then yes it would thanks kirk thank i think kirk. that answers it quite well but we've got another question that's come up um if there's time let's just quickly answer this one um given that the entities that are in the gray list markets um, particularly small economies, does that not create inefficiency in the economies that the FSP can exploit? Um, example, spreads in the lending and borrowing rates. Sorry, Carrie ann you broke up. Just start to, that's a very interesting question. I can see Chris mm, eyebrows being raised. That could be interesting. Just ask that again. I apologize, I missed the first part. Given that the entities that are in the grey list markets um are particularly small economies does that not create inefficiency in these economies and that the fsp can exploit example spreading um in lending and borrowing rates mm, okay so it's a, it's an it's an interesting question um the Very answer to which question. yeah the, the answer to which is probably yes but the answer is also perilously close to us expressing an opinion that could be construed as financial advice. So with the greatest amount of respect, I am going to, I'm going to perhaps dodge that question on the webinar. Um, if you leave it in the chat, quite happy, I'll, I'll, I'll put together an answer um, that is completely factual in terms of our views, but again, not to be taken in as financial advice in any way, shape or form. Kirk, are you comfortable with that response? I am comfortable with that, but what, what I would say is that the countries that do go on to the grey list, certainly the ones which uh, we highlighted on the first slide, where you've got smaller economies and there is that desperate need for shifting money out of a country, um, by being on the grey list, it just means that there's going to be an enhanced level of any, uh, money laundering and terrorist counterfeiting so it's actually going against what the gray list is put in these countries are in place so it just makes them even more deep rooted and much more difficult to come off of that list in the first place yeah i think that's uh that's a very very good point i think the uh sort of the, the the underpinning message or the overarching message is that it's definitely a list we don't want to be a part of and we need to do everything in our power to stay off of um, so sorry, Karen. I think we've just. Um, I'm gonna. For any other questions, please just. Uh, we'll 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 put together uh, the questions and answers, the ones we haven't already answered, and we'll put we'll send that out to everyone with the um, with the um, recording. Just as a perhaps just as a final a final note from me, um, uh, we have um, we've got. 
Uh, the Austin Morrison Associates Global Group of Companies operates in many different jurisdictions, and within each of those jurisdictions, we have certain jurisdictional obligations when it comes to financial services and providing advice and so on and so forth, and we take those obligations enormously seriously, um, obviously. So if you do want to get in touch with Austin Morrison, chat to one of our consultants, it may be that you are dealing with the South African business, and it might be that you are seeking products from one of the other businesses that is located offshore. Um, so yeah, if you do get in touch with us, that will be, um, that will be what we will be telling you and yeah thank you very much for joining us today it was a real pleasure wesley thank you for your time uh kirk thank you for your time thanks for your your insight and i really hope everyone on the call uh learned something um don't be too negative about it but uh forewarned is forearmed we need to prep ourselves it is a reality with which we have been dealt um fingers crossed we won't get there um but we we we, we might and we need to be prepared for that so um yeah thanks to everyone uh Kerry Ann, thanks for uh, sorting out the questions there and thanks to everyone for joining us and i will begin the session uh, sorry i'll end the session the way i began it good afternoon to you all and if you're not in south africa good morning good afternoon and good evening we will chat again soon thanks for your time goodbye